Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to uh, today's Leaders Forum at the Yale School of Management. Uh, obviously, we have a capacity audience here in the GM room, uh, and we have a filled overflow room across famous Hill House Avenue. Uh, I also want to welcome students and faculty uh, from the Global Network for Advanced Management, a uh, network of uh, 23 top business schools around the world. And Yale School of Management is a uh, very proud member of that network of top business schools. I, I think it would be really fun to come here because I actually like the mission you guys have. It's more than just straightforward, you know, let's go magnify our personal wealth. Uh, it's actually about trying to make the world a better place, something I care a lot about. I think that's sort of embedded in the mission of the School of Management, right? I think Absolutely. that's sort of why everybody's here. Something you talk about a lot, which is mobility. Yeah. So, how, how, you know, what are the drivers? Where is it going to take us? Well, let's what are start, the limits? Let, let's start with your world, right, here in the developed world. What does our future look like? Well, we're already pretty, mu pretty much connected. Moore's Law, which is the doubling of computational performance every couple of years, is going to continue for another five or ten years. There's evidence that it's slowing, uh, but at the moment I think it'll be driving a lot of this. Your devices get cheaper and your world is a mobile one. All of the startups that you will join will build mobile applications first and they'll do it on iPhones and on Android phones. Um, Android, of course, is from Google and in Java or Objective-C. Uh, they're backed up and the, all of the services are on cloud computing where you have amazing computational performance on these super, super computers that can answer interesting questions like, where do I want to go tonight? Who am I going to meet? What movie do I want to go to? Um, the fundamental questions of life, I guess. <laughs> and the kind of thing that we can do with the kind of AI that we can now put forth is really remarkable. A uh, typical example is that eventually, and this is all maybe even again fully with your permission, the computer can listen to what you're saying and say, no, actually, Eric, you're just making shit up. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, you're making things up and you, should, um, and you should maybe say something different. So the fact of the matter is we have a situation where we have a, uh, an integration of the ability to do automatic translation, uh, which of course allows us to talk to everybody in the world. But this kind of computational power that I'm describing in these interconnected networks, it is a remarkable time to be part of our world. But to me, the thing that's interesting is that sounds pretty interesting to me. That's the world that you all will build in your companies and where you go. Um, if you imagine a person in a poor country uh, where there's almost no connectivity. At the moment, they just have an SMS-capable phone. They don't even have browsers. Someday in the next couple of years, they're going to get a smartphone with 100 different languages, all the world's information, every form of entertainment and knowledge, including syllabi and information here from Yale, and that's a heart attack moment for them. You think your world's going to change? Imagine what it's like to go from no information to infinite information. All right. So. One part of this is just the sheer number of people will have mobile devices. Your number is, is it five? There are on the order of bill? six billion mobile phones in use today. Um, it's estimated that that covers somewhat more than five billion people, because some people have more than one phone. Um, and there are on the order of seven plus billion. So one of the great accomplishments in the last decade is that most people have access to a mobile phone, although it's usually just a talking phone. And uh, in the next few years, those will all get upgraded. Now, that puts lots of pressure on things like the networks, and the networks are overpriced, and, those, and people are working those things out. But we have wired those people, right, with mobile phones, because people communicate, even in poor countries. So what's the, I mean, is it obvious that this applies to all firms? This is a, a, a question from uh, somebody who was here just, just yesterday, uh, Dominic Barton from McKinsey. Yes, who I know well. And Dominic said, he said, why, why don't you ask Eric the following question? Is this really important for, say, a mining company? What's your, what's your answer to that? A, a mining company that, uh, sorry, with respect to their business or? Yeah, their business, the, the, the mobility. Well, the first problem is if you're a mining company, you're probably doing things which are extractive, which, have, which could be polluters. 
So the first problem you have is that now everyone has a phone. So if you're doing something which is inappropriate, people are going to document it. So sorry to be obnoxious, but I think that that's, that's in fact the reality, is that you used to be able to do things without people seeing things, and now people are noticing. This is the problem that China has with this environmental thing. So let's assume that this is a well-run mining firm, and they're doing the right things and, and helping the world be a better place. Um, why does this matter to them? Because economic growth continues. That this is, in fact, the core reason why economics grow. If you look globally, the Europeans seem to have decided to have a simultaneous recession for a few years, which they are clearly planning at some level. <laughs> um, the Americans seem to have decided to have a slow growth recovery. Uh, and Asia and Latin America are growing pretty fast. Uh, a lot of that growth is because of the rise from abject poverty to sort of what we would think of as lower middle class. That drives huge consumer markets, which this mining company would ultimately be part of a supply chain for. So it does matter. It matters a lot. And so, n not that you're going to start running a mining company, but if you were running a mining company, that you would be pushing <laughs> pushing mob mobile technologies there. Well, I'll give you an example. We um, one which I know well. Uh, one of our largest enterprise customers is the largest steel manufacturer in the world, which happens to be in South Korea. So why does this matter to them? Well, it turns out that they have you know, 100,000 employees. And those 100,000 employees' productivity is far greater when they're using mobile devices from the standpoint of monitoring the process that's going on with respect to steel production, industrial safety, which they care a great deal about. And they've, in fact, transformed their whole promotion process, evaluation process, and so forth using mobile devices, which was not possible before. So there's example after example in businesses where the empowerment of individuals increases essentially industrial productivity and in particular safety. And companies, because they're sort of closed <coughs> systems, can actually decide what you're going to use your mobile device for. And companies care about the quality of their employees, the quality of their service, <laughs> uh, issues around material manufacturing, procurement, et cetera, inventory management, all of which are now enabled by mobile phones. Um, Amazon, for example, uh, one of the sort of leaders in a lot of the manufacturing stuff now has a completely automated pick and pack system, which again uses mobility as part of it. We just bought a company to do that. It's how they scale. So, so ultimately, these mobile devices and mobile networks allow you to scale globally, have accurate information, instantaneous information. Uh, the world that you all are going to be joining already assumes industrial ERP and MRP systems, which were designed 20 years ago. The new model is a mobility model where you know exactly where everything is and where everybody is, and then you're that much more productive as a result. You know where the trucks are, you know where the assets are, you know what the customers are doing. Okay, so let, let me shift to a different, you know, big theme for you, which is along with mobility, you've got, as you just mentioned, empowerment, distribution of power using technology. Um, and as you point out that oftentimes, the technology can be used for evil, but then there are these counterbalancing forces, the people who keep track of whether a company is doing something wrong. Sure. Uh, corruption, excessive uh, force, all kinds of situations where people can, can help using technology to, and uh, you, in the book you talk about governments in exile can become more effective. So there are all kinds of interesting uh, implications of technology in the social setting. You also talk about asymmetric risks. And this is something that I find uh, perplexing, just from my own point of view, where uh, it's hard for me to evaluate some of the concerns that people have about technology. So uh, just to bring people up to date, we had Craig Mundy from Microsoft here within d just a few weeks ago this month. And, and Mr. Mundy's uh, message was, frankly, a lot of concern about cyber terrorism. And, and his point was there's so much already done by governments and companies in some cases that there can be massive kind of cyber attacks at any one point in time. And what, what, uh, what's, what's troubling to me is I can't evaluate whether he's right. And if, if, if he is right, I, I understand I'm supposed to be scared, but who am I supposed to trust then? Am I supposed to trust the government? 
I, I have a libertarian streak in me. I don't, I don't know what. And then, and then I think, well, how do I, how do I, how is he going to be proved right? It's relatively calm, I would say, on the cyber terrorism front. If, if all this stuff is really going to happen, why don't we see little, I know we see some flare-ups, but why don't we see more flare-ups? So, so, so let's, how, divide, let's divide these into two separate I'm questions. rambling, but no, 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 you no, get no, the no, point. No, that's, that these, by the way, you did a great job of anticipating everyone's fears. I'm scared, yeah. I mean, how do I, I, I <laughs> By definition, I'm a citizen, right, I realize exactly could, how people think, right? I, I could be really, you know, our whole systems could get shut down, but I'm also worried about our society changing yeah. fundamentally. Well, let's, let's talk about two separate parts. First, uh, Craig, Craig is a good friend, and I found that he's generally right. So unfortunately, we'll have to do, it, it, we have to well, really I can't just blow him off. Yeah, we have to take him very seriously. Okay. In fact, we interviewed him for the book, he's that good. Page um, 105. So, <laughs> I'm serious. So, so let's, start, let's start with the coexistence of the digital world and the physical world. Now, all of us are experts in the physical world. We've got, we're citizens of a country. There are all these rules that, that govern our behavior. There's a police, there's jails, there's military. You know, we, we understand all of that. Um, I've come to a view, and we say this in the book, that there's also a different society, which is the digital cyberspace world, which we also cohabit, and that each world keeps the other one in check. So in the case of the physical world, if you do something really illegal on, in the cyberspace world, the physical world can probably track you down. The police can probably find you, and there are many ways in which they can do that. And so please don't do terrible crimes in cyberspace in the same way that you shouldn't do them in physical space. In other words, physical space keeps the, the virtual world sort of under some level of control. The same is also true in reverse. So let's pick China, an easy, an easy target here. Um, they're trying very hard to censor the internet for all sorts of political and, and other immoral reasons. And they've decided to censor, censor speech. Something called Weibo comes out, which is um, the sort of a the union of, think of it as Twitter and Facebook together. Uh, there's a terrible train accident. It turns out the government tries to cover it up. Uh, alarmed citizens publicize what was going on. They ask questions. Eventually, the government actually is forced to admit not only were these people, were they lying, but in fact, the guy running it is now in jail under a death sentence. Um, that's the internet keeping the physical world under control. There is example after example where, especially in poorly managed city, uh, uh, countries and in countries where uh, the police may be corrupt. Uh, we went to Mexico. We talk about this in the book. Um, how do you use the internet to keep society a little bit more even? It's particularly important w uh, for, for many people in the world uh, when you see the sort of terrible crimes committed against women in these developing worlds. So again, the, the sort of the, the empowerment of citizens does keep the physical world under some level of control. I view this as generally very good. Now, so, so in, in any case, independent of my view, this is happening. Right, so it's sort of a get with the program guys kind of a thing. We're going from a world where people were largely not connected and not informed to a world where most people are fully connected and fully informed. Which brings on the second part of your question, which has to do, oh, woe is me, there are bad people on the internet too. Now, I was part of the group that started developing this stuff 30 years ago, and none of us actually thought that there would be bad people on the internet, because the people who were on the internet were our friends. So most of the systems didn't even have passwords, and if we did use passwords, we transmitted them in the clear. I was one of the people who got a master's thesis awarded to me by Berkeley because of the work that I did that was completely insecure. Now they've since changed their mind, right? Although they <laughs> left me keep my master's thesis. So, so it shows you how naive we were compared to what would really happen. Now today's students and scientists and so forth understand that the world is not all perfect, um, that you have these problems, and it's a race. And what Craig talks about, and indeed talks about in the book, Here's an example. A typical problem you have is you have a computer. Let's pick a university, not Yale. This computer's been running for years. No one's really paid any attention to it. Some other group finds it and hijacks it. So Craig makes the argument that the ISPs who run networks will in fact actually get the legal power to quarantine these machines. And will actually shut them down logically from the standpoint of the network until some human comes along and verifies that, yes, we own this, and we know, and so forth, and we can detect that. So these are some of the techniques that are being developed. Um, the rough numbers on cyber, cyberspace, cyber attacks, are something like this. Today, the majority of the press is about attacks from China, but China is not the only um, country that's doing this. 
The Chinese attacks appear to be uh, information theft, essentially intellectual property theft, to benefit their domestic industries, as well as testing, right, learning, with some supervision of dissidents groups that are outside of the country. And we have lots of evidence that this is true. There's lots of reports, lots of break-ins, and so forth. I, I, I can speak with some authority that that's true. There's evidence that Iran is busy doing this. Why is not completely clear. The Iranians are sufficiently crazy that they've announced that they're going to have their, this is the government, not the people, um, that the, the government has decided they're going to have their own internet because they don't like the public internet. It's going to be the Iranian internet. They're going to shut everything else down. And then last week they announced they wanted to have their own Google Earth, which presumably is going to be called the Iranian Earth, which presumably will omit Israel. You know, this is how crazy this stuff is, right? You know, we don't like them, we'll just erase them from that. Um, so this is the kind of thinking that's going on. Um, there's evidence that Russia's doing it. There's, it, uh, there's evidence that some other countries are doing this as well. Uh, there's some evidence, I don't know it, uh, that America's involved in some of these activities as well. Okay. Let's open it up to questions. First from uh, the audience here in the GM room. Fire away. Is on. Uh, Google's at the forefront of developments in machine learning and artificial intelligence, yes. which I think is one area where in just the last five to ten years, compared to other areas, we've seen enormous advancements in uh, the state of the technology. And I think it's possible that we're at the cusp of a wave of mass automation through machine learning and artificial intelligence. Yeah. I want to get your thoughts on what you think that means for the lower income parts of society, where there might be you know, mass labor displacement, as well as in developing nations. So I, I would like to distinguish, this is a great question, I'd like to distinguish between the developments of AI and machine learning and the general question of automation. So let's do it as two parts. Uh, with respect to AI, um, the advances are quite significant in machine learning, machine vision. So for example, face detection is now quite good. People are doing image detection and so forth. Uh, and the ability for computers to sort of uh, uh, analyze videos and so forth uh, will become very, very important over time. Uh, we're right on the edge of that. Uh, most of the machine learning is human assisted. In other words, the human has to phrase the question properly and then the machine can learn what the outcome functions are. Uh, Google itself uses machine learning in many of its functions, especially in the advertising business. Uh, and this will continue. Um, I think over time, uh, things like uh, predicting a traffic jam. You know, when we see this pattern of the New York bridges, you know, we know that there's gonna be a traffic jam one hour later over here and the computers will be able to learn that. Um, as you know, with machine learning, it's always a function of the quality of the input. One of the problems with machine learning technically is that there's so much information coming in now that determining what the, the differentiators are is turning out to be very difficult. You know, what do you really care about? Um, the general question that you asked was, was more about automation. And let me give you a framing that I have sort of come up with, um, and see if you like it. Um, think of this as a race. Okay. And it's a race between automation and creativity. Okay. You all, Yale and so forth, are part of the creative side. You're trying to be creative, you're trying to invent new things, you're trying to add value and so forth. What happens if automation wins? There's no jobs. By definition, automation eliminates a job that was done by a human. It's now being done by an automaton of some kind. Um, my favorite example here is it's uh, CVS which has a, 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 a minimum wage employee who's the supermarket scanner person, and they've replaced this by a machine that must cost many, many tens of thousands of dollars where I check myself out, right? So the, the logic of automation, and presumably this is a good business decision for them, so that tells me that we've just eliminated a few more low wage jobs here in America. This can't be good, right? So what's the answer? Education. I can't think of anything else because, I mean, Presumably, as you move up the, the sort of education chain, you're more creative, you have more energy, you work harder, all those kinds of things. Um, so I don't know any other solution, and I'm particularly worried about uh, using China as my favorite example here, um, about the uh, manufacturing jobs in China, because in the next decade, they'll largely be automated out by robots. So you have a, a, you know, a, a country that's aspiring to be a modern economy, which could, in theory, have a very large and very disruptive jobless problem, literally because of automation. And the same will be true in other countries. I don't know how to solve this problem except for open labor markets, better in you know, all the stuff we learn in, in, in business school, right? 
free and global competition, open access to information, free and flow of capital, investment, you know, the things, banking. Another example is uh, in our tour, we went to 30 different countries. And we went to a lot of countries which have gone from um, authoritarian, you know, dictators, or one Tunisia classic example, to what looks roughly like a democracy. Maybe it isn't really a democracy, but it's a lot better than the de than. Mm -hmm. So you ask these people, okay, well, good. You know, you now have an elected, you know, government. What is your business like? And they say, well, we're going to do farming, and tourism, because they don't have a manufacturing base, because they never built one. So how are they going to do? Global manufacturing, global farming is incredibly non-remunerative. Right? They have to build the knowledge society, the people, the factories, the service economy, the sophisticated universities, and they have to do it now. Can't wait a year. There's enormous pressure on these countries. Yes. Hello. Um, you just mentioned countries like, I think, Burma, where like the country goes through a like rough phase and a big phase of transformation. I was wondering what um, you see like is Google's role in helping policy shaping or helping those nations to develop and get a good access to um, technology? Well, we were just in Myanmar, Burma, uh, a few weeks ago and met with the general who freed Aung San Suu Kyi as well as Aung San Suu Kyi, who's known universally as the lady there. And her story, of course, is a magical story of imprisonment and, and freedom and so forth. Um, it's interesting, as a, it's sort of the second worst country from an internet perspective, the first being North Korea, uh, which we also went to. Uh, and in Burma's case, there's essentially no internet connectivity. And the phone system, well, they claim it works, but trust me, it doesn't work. You were just there. So your, your phone didn't work either. The phone didn't work. Yeah. So, um, you must have stayed in a nice hotel then. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in that case, um, Burma is quite interesting because they were such a closed society that they, they did not even use the, the correct international coding for characters called Unicode. So they couldn't even use their, their Myanmar language, whatever it's called, uh, like it's the uh, Myanmar language. They couldn't even use it as part of their computers correctly. So that's where they are. They're literally starting. And I met with the computer scientists there who are very, very smart, and it's like building a whole society. The good news is they can copy what other people do, so they'll get there through the quickly. Met with the commanding generals who still basically run the country and tried to explain to them what an open, competitive telecom industry looks like. So that's, I think, the advocacy that we can do at this point. Google will not make money in such a country for a very long time, but we're patient. Um, and it's important that the citizens of Burma have access to this information. Yes. Years ago, um, you took a decision to pull out of China because of uh, you know the policies there. I'm very curious to know what what went inside your head as a leader to take that decision and you know not not go against it. And what were what were the pressures on you to do it or not do it? Well, Google famously does not do things necessarily for revenue. And what happened, the actual sequence was that uh, we were attacked by what we now understand are agents of the Chinese military. We knew it was a professional attack because they took the weekends off. <laughs> you know, no, no, proper hack, no proper university hacker takes the weekend off. I mean, you know, they worked nine to five, you know? They went out at night, right? Uh, you think I'm kidding? This is true. Um, so, uh, so in any, and, and there are many other reasons why we knew it was that. Um, so that sort of annoyed us no end. We've since strengthened our services. Um, we were very annoyed at the surveillance that the Chinese government was doing against people who uh, seemed to us to be pretty innocent, uh, but who were um, in their target list of dissidents in other countries. Um, and we were particularly annoyed about the censorship program, which in China is active. You get a phone call. It's illegal to reveal the details of the censorship, so I'll just summarize them as there's something, somebody will say something, and you'll get a phone call saying, take it down right now. And it's really active censorship. And it's the only country where that's practiced today. So we moved to Hong Kong, um, we, and we told them, you know, you say it's you know, um, one country, two systems. We like the other system. They didn't like that very much. <laughs> so we moved over to Hong Kong, and they, ha they have something called the Chinese Firewall, called the Great Firewall, which is a censorship proxy which they administer. So we could honestly tell you, we're not doing the censoring, they're doing it. 
Uh, and that's, I think, a stable situation for the moment. Internally, the decision was made by the senior executives uh, and in the two founders in particular, Sergei, who had, had grown up in Russia and had experience with sort of very tough censorship, had very strong opinions about this. So it was ultimately a decision by consensus by a majority of executives. And, and as a study in crisis management, um, we did it about as well as you could. You know, we had, the, we had the meetings, we had the facts in front of us, we had a good internal debate, and you make a decision. But one of the things you learn about decision making is that you don't want a single person making a decision, you want groups making decisions, and you want those groups to be making the decisions under the principle of we'll make the best decision, not the consensus decision. So the way this works is if, you know, you guys in the front row or the management team, we'll sit there and debate Right, until we hear the best idea, and everyone says that's the best idea, as opposed to warring consensus arguments. You know, just let's, let's debate and debate how do we deal with this, and ultimately that's how we did it. Let me put in a, a little quote from the book to encourage you to pursue this important issue further. Uh, th this is the quote from the book. This, the disparity between American and Chinese firms and their tactics will put both the government and companies of the United States at a distinct disadvantage. The United States will not take the same path of digital corporate espionage as its laws are much stricter and better enforced and because illicit competition violates the American sense of fair play. Interesting. Anjani, how about a question from elsewhere? Yeah, disembodied voice. Uh, <laughs> so perhaps I'll go back to China. So there are a couple of questions from the Renmin University, China School of Business, a <clears throat> global network school. And the questions I think of could be relevant almost in any part of the world. I'll combine two questions. <clears throat> the first is there are a lot of arguments in China about how technology will change the retail industry. Will the retail, traditional retail model survive? And the related question is, is about the emerging new media, its impact <coughs> uh, on the traditional media. How will traditional media like newspapers, magazines, etc., survive? So an example, using China as a positive example, um, in the decade and a half, two decades that I've been going back and forth to China, the change in terms of banking retail, retail distribution has been astounding. And the countries seem to go through the f roughly the following path. They have a poor banking system, and the only way you as a consumer can get money is you use, um, you, you keep literally money in your mattress, or you get essentially deposit slips, literally the equivalent of cashier's checks. You, you move it by hand. Then the banking system moments up to encourage the equivalent of debit and credit cards as we know now. Uh, after a while, some form of distribution and ability to buy online emerges, and then a whole industry of electronic commerce is born. Um, we're in the latter stages of that in China. Five years ago, we were still learning how to use the credit cards and, and payments and so forth in the renminbi. Um, for example, Burma, which is sort of at the beginning of that, is just now opening up its banking system so that it has banks. Before that, if you needed the money, you got it from a general, roughly speaking. You can imagine that the general might take a cut, although I'm not saying that, that I know that, but it, it makes sense if I were a general. Uh, so, so in China's case, the retail sector is booming. There are issues around the distribution markets and how do you actually get physical goods, but the Chinese are very clever. So my own opinion about retail in China is that it will ultimately look a lot like the United States and Europe that you'll have a combination of bricks and mortar and a combination of digital goods. Um, uh, there are many, many examples. Taobao is an example, Alibaba and so forth uh, that are good examples of the future of eBay, eBay type sites. What is interesting about China is that they, they seem to have a rule that the global firms don't really become the, nat the global Chinese firms. The Chinese firms all seem to have a Chinese ownership structure and there's evidence that the government favors the Chinese firms in many ways. And I've, I've since learned, after our experience, that that's the norm for most industries. Uh, the second question was about media. the media. The core problem in the media is that consumption is increasing and the distribution model is changing. 
So in some countries, uh, in, for example, in Britain, the newspaper, Britain and Germany, the newspapers remain profitable, uh, having to do with the culture and society and excellent execution on those. Uh, in France and the United States, uh, circulation has been de de declining, and it causes a, a real, pr real economic pressure on the incumbents. Um, a, some examples in the US of success are that many people are doing um, uh, things on the iPad, you know, where you get a subscription model. And my guess would be that the incumbents will largely move to subscription models on things like iPads and Android tablets. Uh, there are examples of successful advertising-only model companies. Politico and Huffington Post are two examples that are hybrids and or largely things. And so we'll end up, my guess is that people, you all, if you go and found media companies, are more likely to be advertiser supported with a different cost structure. If you go work for a traditional incumbent, you're more likely to have a subscription model where you have both the equivalent of print as well as some kind of a subscription model on a tablet. I think that's probably a stable state. Uh, Larry Page recently said that Google may one day have one million employees. Could you? He said that for years. <laughs> <laughs> what does that look like? And if it's anything close to uh, reality, how would you manage that? And are there other companies that will have hundreds well, of thousands of employees? Well, Walmart already has it, so um, I probably shouldn't comment on, on you know, Larry's comments out of co uh, context, but the opportunity around information is very large. There will be very large companies built, whether it's you know, Google or others. I also think that the next Google, you know, uh, you sort of have the Facebook wave of of excitement, hype, and so forth at that scale. There's another one that's the natural successor to sort of Google Facebook being founded now. Right? Maybe you will found it, maybe you'll work for it, maybe you'll compete with it, and you'll get you know, crushed. Uh, <laughs> welcome, to, <laughs> welcome, to, welcome to how innovation works, right? <laughs> um, so you, you, just never, you just never know. Um, but what I've learned um, uh, as a story, I remember in January of 1993, sitting in my office at Sun, and we had just launched a set of products, and I thought there's been, the world is, this, the world is static. It was nothing new. And I remember sitting in my office thinking, what will I do? I was chief technology officer at the time, and we had just done the Java stuff. And you know, everything I knew was predictable. And then uh, I saw the Mosaic browser, and the world changed. You never know when that event is going to come, but you know that it has something to do with information and in, in employee empowerment, people empowerment, and the rest is history. And this will happen to you too. In terms of, let me just follow up a little bit. In terms of the, you know, characterize the race earlier, um, and the, the the creative side of the race. One of the things that everybody talks about is big data, and the you know, this, this collection machine that uh, is out there. Uh, what are your thoughts about the creative side, the, the implications for people here in terms of understanding how those data are actually being collected? What's the meaning? How, how do we analyze? How, what's the reliability of those data? How do we present those data? How do we you know, connect the dots, so to speak? Is that a, is that where some of the growth in Google employees will, will come from? Is that where some of the investments should be made by people here? I think for, you, for what you're doing, big, big data, which is today a marketing slogan, um, will be a defining aspect of your success. Um, to, make, to render it pragmatically, you're going to need some engineers if you're not an engineer. Um, and on my side of the world, what's happening is engineering groups are going in and they're restructuring every industry. So think about Uber, right, as an example. Um, there's this example after example where a small amount of software, a little bit of data analytics, and you can build a completely new service. Uh, and I would venture to say that every industry is ripe for the application of software engineers and data analytics, big data, to figure out where everything is and either produce a new service or make them more economically efficient. So the tool of competition used to be, as I said, the IT department, ERP, MRP systems. That was sort of what I grew up with. The new tool of, of competition is using data analytics to figure out what your customers need, what you're able to supply them, and do it as efficiently as possible at the lowest possible cost. 
And uh, that, th that theme will be true for at least another decade, I think. There, there you have it, friends. Yes. One of the sorry, thank you. One of the uh, purported benefits of the digital revolution is the, I guess, democracy, uh, <laughs> the ability for anybody to sort of take uh, take a lead in really the creation and development of a new business model. Um, but a lot of the, I guess, a lot of the faces of the digital movement sort of look the same as they did, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Marissa Meyer, notwithstanding. Um, what sort of positive uh, indicators do you see in, in that dynamic changing a little bit going forward? And if not, if there aren't any positive indicators, uh, what do you think that companies such as Google and other uh, leaders like Facebook and Amazon can do to change that going forward? Are you talking mostly about the diversity of the people yeah. or the product line? Women, um, minorities. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the core problem that the industries have is that there's an escalator that women and minorities somehow do not stay on for whatever set of reasons. There's a lot of evidence that these are deeply, uh, deep sociological problems which we have to fix. I want to come back to a possible solution for this. Uh, but ultimately, to using Marissa as an example, um, women who get to the CEO job also get fired if, if they don't perform. Now, Marissa's going to do a great job. But look at Meg, uh, who runs HP, is the follower for, for a, a series of executives, one of whom was female, who, who was discharged. So you're seeing that this obsession around numbers and performance in companies is held, everyone's held at the same standard, which is, I think, ultimately what you want. So the problem is we need more sort of shots, right? We need more people who have a shot at it. We don't have enough women and minorities. Um, there's evidence of bias. Even in the most liberal of companies, a classic example of Google was we measure everything, so we measured our hiring pat pattern, and we discovered that we score the employees as they come in, and we score them a year later. And we discovered a reverse bias against women, that, which was, we don't understand why it existed, but what happened was that p women who were scored low, in fact, performed very well a year later, and the men who scored high performed lower, right? We couldn't quite figure out why. But we ultimately changed the way we recruited women to try to address that bias. So even in the most liberal and educated forms, and I assume it's true here, there are these unconscious sources of bias, um, which are, you know, in my view, just incredibly bad. Right? And we've got to fight through them. There is some hope that this escalator can get fixed. I'm on the board of something called the Khan Academy. And um, Khan Academy is an inversion of the uh, classroom, uh, the basic idea, which we'll see is it true or not, and there's some evidence that it's true, is that students watch the videos at home and in the classroom they gamify a Q&A and basically problem solving in the classroom. The students compete against each other. These are you know, kids in high school and uh, uh, you know, sixth grade, seventh grade. Um, and they get a very interesting performance because it's more self-paced. And the evidence is that for sort of privileged people, right, who had like my background, there's a small improvement, 5 10%, which is statistically significant. We'll take it. But for students who are, quote, remedial, that are troubled kids, which often include minority at risk, et cetera, the gains are up to a factor of 10. And it appears that what happens is that if you're labeled a bad kid, you stop learning, you stop being motivated, when in fact your problem was that you were missing some component that needed to get put in there, and then you could build off of it. And we have lots of examples now where the escalator turned back on, right, once the, the educational map was put there. So I'm very hopeful that we can solve this problem in, in sort of a, certainly your generation of leadership. I really believe that. Because we can measure it, we can see the bias, we can fight against it, we can adjust the, the if we want to, and I think we want to. Anthony? So this is a question from Nicaragua, uh, the Inkai Business School. <coughs> How should, actually, it's related to another question from Technion, so I'll combine the two. Given how technology is rapidly changing our world, uh, what should management schools do to prepare students for their future careers? You touched on some aspects of that. The related question from Inkai <coughs> is, again, how should technology be taught 
in business schools. He made a reference to the need to hire engineers if you're not one already. And I wonder if you could reflect on the role of business schools, management schools. Uh, when, when I was eight years old, I lived in Nicaragua as a summer for, mm. the, for the summer. My father um, was an economist working for the Agency for International Development, so I love Nicaragua. Um, and the, in, in terms of the, the two questions are b probably better left to the faculty here and so forth to drive. I will tell you that the skills you have to have are an appreciation of analytical thought. Um, you're taught that in many, many ways. But even if you yourself are an, not an engineer, business is fundamentally about incentives and analytical thinking. So when you think about people, just try to think about what their, their self-interest is and try to model their behavior. And most of, of human leadership is really about people acting in their own self-interest or what they believe is in the interest of themselves and others around them and people that they care about. And so if you sort of, sort of do that in an analytical way, you can usually predict outcomes. Um, most of our political uh, structures in our country, and I suspect in others, can be modeled as basically the naked, in, naked pursuit of self-interest by groups. Uh, I've since learned, since I didn't take any of these classes and <laughs> reading about this in other parts of history and sociology, that this has been true for thousands of years. And I wish somebody had told me that when I was your age. Right? So as a manager, what I learned was treat people very well, listen to them, figure out what they want to do. And my father used to say, the best way to lead is to have it be their idea, not yours. So I think if you sort of learn all of that, I'm sorry, there's one more lesson I learned, which I didn't, since I did go into business school, which I will abbreviate, DNR OOC, do not run out of cash. <laughs> uh, that is the entire substance of my knowledge of business school, but I'm sure that somewhere along the way, Dean, you teach that rule. And if you don't, you should add a class decided yeah. DNROC. Yeah, okay. If you we'll run out of that. cash, you're in big trouble. <laughs> Unless you're a bank. Separate discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to follow up on that point. Another question, right here. Ho hold, hold on for the mic, OK. Here you go. So um, Google famously does things uh, for purposes other than making money. Um, and I love Google for it. Um, but for many years and still today, uh, in capital societies, most people, the, pre the predominant way of thinking was that a corporate social responsibility of business to maximize profit. I want to get your, you know, from a yeah. business ethics standpoint, your perspective on that. Well, we, we reject that. Um, I was taught as well that the only objective was to maximize profit. I don't think that's correct. I think it's an institution. It has values, it has impact, it has people, it has customers. You know, does that mean that you should be able to pollute the, the land and destroy it? Does that mean that you should be able to lie you know, and thieve and so forth in the pursuit of profits? If you take the argument to its logical thing, then you're basically saying, regulate me to death because I'm just gonna go for it and I'm gonna behave illegally and evilly unless you stop me. Right? You see the logical, I know that's not what you said, but that's the logical conclusion from max, uh, arbitrary maximization of long-term profits. Uh, I would prefer to think of shareholder value as enhanced by principled and ethical leadership. Uh, and you know, those are the shareholders that we want. Uh, when I first started at Google as CEO, the board said, we're doing fine right now. We want you to focus on a decade or 20 years time. So I don't know if we're gonna get to your million employees, but Google will certainly be around in 20 years and hopefully be at the same level of high standards that we're trying to operate today, and I'm very proud of that. Now, in order to achieve that, we also have a dual class shareholder structure, which was highly controversial. But we took the position, and again, because we were going public, we could sort of dictate the structure that we wanted. Uh, we wanted a structure where we could, in fact, make sure that the values that I'm exemplifying are implemented. Many companies do not have that choice because of the way our system works, which tends to drive for short-term earnings. Anjali? <coughs> this is a question from the Seoul National University Business School. <coughs> it quotes David Wein Weinberger in his book, Too Big to Know, uh, who makes a provocative statement. As knowledge becomes networked, the smartest person in the room isn't the person standing at the front lecturing us. I feel conspicuous. And, it, and isn't the collective wisdom of those in the room. 
the smartest person in the room is the room itself, the network that joins the people and ideas in the room and connects to those outside of it. What do you think of this argument? Well, I certainly, I certainly like the argument. I can tell you how in practice it works out is that in a business you want to, businesses have enormous unknown risks ahead of them for every one of them. So when you think as a leader about that, what you want in the room are the smartest people, not the most experienced people. Because you, don't, you can't predict the challenge that you're gonna have in front of you, but if you're highly educated, sophisticated, uh, you think quickly, you think deeply, you have a better shot of getting ahead of your competitor and winning against the objectives that you have. Um, one of the more bizarre things about Google is that no one ever looks at you in meetings because everyone in Google, the social moray, is everyone is on their computers all the time. So uh, for the decade I was CEO, we had a rule that you actually couldn't use your computer for 60 minutes a week, which was the meeting that we called, that we, was our senior management, which was 60 minutes. <laughs> and I made people look at each other in the eye and have a conversation. Oh my goodness. Um, People would, of course, take their Blackberries and mobile phones, Androids and iPhones, and they would do it under the table. <laughs> and you know, we would sort of catch them, right? tell them to stop. You, it's just 60 minutes a week. Okay, that's how difficult it was. Um, Larry has chosen not to implement this rule, so I sit there in the meetings just typing away. And that's considered good. And I have a feeling that uh, this sort of the, a lot of things are changing as a result of these new models. Um, one of the executives and I have talked about some of this as a principle, and we call it the issues around smart, creative people. The people in your generation are not going to be willing to work in the industrial structures that your parents and grandparents invented. You're going to find them too boring. You're going to want to be more empowered. You're going to want to have more, more impact. You're going to want to work for a higher purpose. You're not willing to be a wage slave or an organization man in the language of the 50s. You're just not. Your expectations are different, your skills are different, you're better educated. On every, on every metric, you're a stronger candidate and you need to be productive. And going back to this issue of global challenges, society needs you. And in case you're confused, since all the baby boomers are rec retiring and there's lots of them, your productivity needs to increase very high in order to support us in our retirement. So there's lots of reasons why we want you to work hard and be very productive. How about right here in the blue shirt? So part of your response was actually a great segue to this question. Um, for all the amazing things that technology has brought to the world, um, I think at a certain point it can start to erode sort of basic aspects of what it means to be human. Um, hence your comments about people being on their computers literally every waking minute. So at what point does technology become too much a part of our lives, and how does a company like Google deal with a deep philosophical question like that? Uh, do you have an off button on your device? Yes. yes. Do you know how to use it? <laughs> <laughs> good, good, occasionally. So, so I think these are, these are questions higher than Google can answer. You know, when do you turn off the off button? This, these are ultimately your decision. And I think you're going to find people who will never turn them off, people who will choose to turn them on as appropriate. They're highly addictive technologies, as you, as you pointed out. Um, there, there's something unique about being human and being with humans that computers are not going to replace anytime soon. And I hope we all remember that. Um, for me, I try to turn off my devices during dinner, which I've timed at 90 minutes. <laughs> It's hard. I, I guess there was a story in yesterday's paper about devices that would tell us to do certain things. I guess you could have a device that would monitor whether you turned off your device. And, but, and you know, it was right. saying, you know, I mean, you need to just can assist you sit up straight. Problem, but, but at the end of the day, what I would say, is, I, I, I want to be clear, and we talk about this in the book, that, that this new digital world does not excuse you from having judgment. Right? The new digital world is not going to solve all of your problems as much as we would like to. One of the most important judgment things is when to use it and when to not use it and how to judge it. But I'm a big believer in, in thinking about what's going on around you digitally and deciding what you as a human being want to do. And I, I do worry that people will sort of slavishly just follow what they're told. 
is a long history of humanity doing that. Um, and I think it's, this gets back to this notion of the creativity side of the automation fight. Part of creativity is learning doubt, learning that there are alternative points of view, uh, going from rote learning, right, the old way of learning, to being able to deal with ambiguity. And a lot of the problems in the world in the future will have an ambiguous component. You won't be quite sure because people will be marketing falsehoods to you online. Does that make sense to me? This, if you've, I assume people here have used the Snopes uh, website. Um, if, you hear, if it doesn't make sense to you, kind of check it out before you randomly announce it to everybody as a fact. A little bit of doubt is not a bad thing. Check it out before you say yes. I, I realize there are so many more questions, and uh, I want to get one in, and we might have time for one more, and then a, a wrap-up comment. But you know, people think of you as somebody who really added so much to uh, Google's uh, franchise value and durable value, and obviously as a technology thought leader. But if I could ask you to step back a little bit and comment on, on capitalism. And, and to what extent do we, should, should all of us have confidence in capitalism? And, and let me just start with, with the observation that there are a lot of companies whose franchise value in particular countries will depend on local rules, regulations, competition policy. And in some cases, judgments by the senior executives that they don't want to play by those rules, as was brought up. And then, in addition, just the, you, we, we all know that uh, in, in the United States, there were banks bailed out. And I think that gave a you know, sort of sense that, the, well, there's another source of randomness. And then we've got income inequalities widening for reasons I don't think are due to the tax code. I think they're more due to skill and technology and, and, and the nature of competition. Uh, and then we're still, it seems like, according to you, early in this technology revolution, which adds some more you know, dynamics to capitalism and it, it doesn't mean that the technology is not meritorious, but from, from the average person's point of view, or more than just the average person's point of view, this can be dizzying. Mm -hmm. with, with the result that, in, by contrast to say the 1980s, where a lot of people in the US had confidence in market-based outcomes, going forward, do you think not so much just as a technology thought leader, but more as a person who thinks about the fate of capitalism, that, that people are going to have the same confidence that markets work. Mm -hmm. well, I don't see an alternative. And I would further argue that capitalism is going to become even more important in the global globalization that we're about to go through. That um, the people who try to hold back the forces of capitalism by arbitrary restrictions, tariffs, uh, all the classic theory, which of course you are an expert in. Um, th they work for a while, but they eventually fall apart. You know, subsidies and you know, weird special interests and so forth and so on, they can live for a while, but in a globalized market, they get exposed fairly quickly. So capitalism, and I'm obviously strongly in favor of capitalism, um, is the primary engine of job growth in most of the Western world and certainly in Asia. Capitalism is clearly the way in which America will grow out of its current morass. Capitalism is clearly how economic wealth has grown. It's how new jobs are created. It's new markets are created. And simple economics, which people seem to sort of forget, like having more customers is better than having fewer. Having, you know, it's like not that complicated. Even I figured it out. Um, so even if you disagree with what I'm saying, which I, I doubt anyone here does, uh, there aren't other good examples or alternative models. Um, I visited with the French socialists, and they are actually socialists, not capitalists. That's why they're called socialists, by the way. Um, and it, sort of the model of, of industrial allocation doesn't work. Um, in Burma, for example, run by a military dictatorship, 
They've built a whole new capital for themselves of French-inspired chateaus, beautiful marble villas, and so forth, while the rest of the country is in abject poverty. 40% of the, of the children do not have enough nutrition to have proper mental development. These other systems don't produce good human outcomes. So even if you reject that argument, which again, I doubt people here, the Asians are tremendous capitalists. They're growing faster, they've got better educational systems, their students are better educated, the family structures are more focused around education, and they are going to run circles around us. So even if you don't like that, right, what's your alternative? Right? You're gonna work for the government. In fact, the corporations are now, because of technology, moving significantly faster than governments. And I think one of the reasons that I enjoy what I'm doing now is that Google has such reach because we're a private firm, right? That we can actually run at Google speed, whereas governments, which are complicated compromises among lots of special interests, even in democracies, have all sorts of reasons why they move slowly, including the fear of failure. Capitalism means that you can take risks. Uh, capitalism means that you can create jobs. And in the cases where governments are doing bailouts, such as in the banks, I, as a capitalist, sit there and say, well, if they're gonna bail them out now, what's to prevent them from bailing them out again? In other words, if we have to do this now, how do we know this isn't going to become perpetual? And one of the observations that I've made, um, speaking as an outsider coming into the business community, is a lot of businesses seem to have gotten there because they were granted special privileges way back when. In a modern capitalistic structure, those, those privileges will be eroded by, company, by technologies like the internet. And remember that the internet is a phenomenal disintermediator. The internet allows you to create companies very quickly, and it allows you to create uh, to, con to connect consumers and producers. The democratization of everything is really the end of these kinds of privileges. What's our alternative? Capitalism is great. Well, I, that's a, a, a stunning answer. Uh, do you, and it's I, hope you, I hope you agree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I, mean, what, what I, agree I agree uh, wholeheartedly. I, I will say that uh, I don't know that, uh, I, I suspect a lot of people around the world and in various government circles need to hear that answer and need to, need to sit down and have the conversation that we just had. Um, you know, I, I go back to how, how does all the food show up on the table in all these cities? Capitalism. There's no, there's no, you know, we, we tried rational, we tried standard planning in the Soviet Union, it didn't work. And I mean, this, this, this is as basic as food, water. Look at the India transformation in 20 years. They couldn't even feed people. Now it's a dynamic thing because of the adoption of capitalism. And look and, at China. And the it's internet the by itself was Absolutely. a huge, Absolutely. I had an interesting debate with uh, Raghu Rajan, many of you know, uh, and asked him, you know, to, to what extent was a government reform in India or simply the internet. But that, that's another conversation. But I, I, I also think your point about D-N-R-O-O-C yeah, is also that. really important. <laughs> I mean, we want companies to be like Google, to be innovative, to have great values, to care, to have courage, but you better not run out of cash. Right. Well, whenever you have a system which sort of privatizes the gains and socializes the losses, which is a lot of regulatory structures, you don't really have perfect capitalism. And there are reasons why you want regulation, but you want to be sensitive to the fact of is it possible to fail. Um, in the industry that I represent, there's lots of failures all the time, and we celebrate the failures because that entrepreneur learns something and then they try again and they try again. Um, there, there are plenty of examples of people that I've worked with and so forth brilliant people who tried something that didn't work and then they invent something which is humongous. And, and, and I think that's a wonderful aspect of capitalism. But that is, I mean, to me, this confidence in capitalism does get down to values and behaviors that, and the you know, behaviors of one of which you just mentioned, celebrating failure, celebrating success, very important. Um, we are out of time. I'll just make one closing comment. I always like to think about takeaways uh, for myself, I, I think this point that you made about being analytical is so fundamental. It's why we're all here. And, and you know, what, one of the things that we talk about here is that MBAs come in with their own
timelines and perspectives, learning how competition works, organizations, understanding complexity, and they encounter a very different set of people, our faculty. And in some sense, I think business schools make a mistake in, in sometimes saying, oh, well, we're all alike, these two cultures. But I think one of the great things about the value of the exchange here is that the MBAs learn a lot from these very analytical folks, and then the faculty learn a lot from the MBAs who are going out and figuring out how to do yeah. things in multiple sectors over the long haul. So staying analytical, and, and, and for the students here and elsewhere on the network, when you encounter very analytical people trying to figure out how they think, uh, what, how did they get to these good ideas? It's, it, that following thought, being around really great analytical thinkers, I think it's one of the great pleasures. That's a segue into me saying, it's really been a pleasure to have Eric Schmidt here. I know that uh, you'll join me in thanking him for uh, his Thank you. Thank you.